10,000 years ago, the direct ancestors to today's uh, domestic horses, uh, the original wild horses, disappeared from the Americas. Uh, we don't know exactly why. It was a time of change. This is when the mammoths and other megafauna disappeared in that part of the world. Early humans could have had an influence. But we do know horses made a comeback in the 1500s with the Spanish and then eventually other European peoples coming into South and Central and North America. And I want to tell you the story of one of these horses that made that journey across the Atlantic, the one that was found in Haiti. And to start this story, I want to take you back to the Spanish community of Castile, May 1572. And Castile is the center of horse breeding uh, for Spain. So a lot of wonderful horses, a lot of our modern horse breeds can trace some of their lineage back to this part of Spain, the Iberian Peninsula. And in May of that year, a mare's laboring all night, quietly, in the sweet and warm Spanish air. In the pre-dawn hours, she, she suffers silently, but she finally gives birth to a healthy foal. With his first knicker, he announces his arrival to the world, and he should be proud because his own origins date back to the earliest horse breeds located in Southern Europe. Later in this life, he, this foal, a colt, becomes a stallion, probably a gelding. He matured. He's got a strong Iberian lineage. He's part of a long line of excellent riding horses. And so he's sold. He's traded to an explorer who's making his way to the new world. An adventure awaits both of them. So he's carefully loaded onto this large sailing vessel, and, and he's got to make about a three-week crossing across the Atlantic Ocean. It's very perilous in this time. Any rough weather could capsize the boat. But thankfully, his crossing was uneventful, and in 1575, he arrives in the city of Puerto Real, Haiti. He settles down, lives his life as he was bred and meant to be. He was ridden to and fro, but sadly for him, in his mid-teens, he suffers a serious bout of colic. Now, there's no true veterinarians at the time, but a local specialist treats him with a home brew. He's used it on other horses in the past, and they seem to recover, but sadly, this horse doesn't, and he dies in the night. Eventually, his owner buries him right outside the town. His story doesn't pick up until 400 years later when a team of archaeologists uncover parts of his remains. And now, today, they're able to tell his story long forgotten. And in this podcast, we're going to explore him and more. And Secretariat being led, he is numbering... The horse. And the horse is the best thing in the world, isn't it? So I suppose one's always, I've always loved them, really. Ever since I was a little girl. Everybody's in line, and they're off. The secretary of the way very well has good position. The love. Oh, I never thought owning a horse could mean so much to me. The secretary is not taking the lead. The madness. What kind of a horse is that? I've never seen a horse like that before. Lightning now. He is moving like a tremendous machine. Their story. Mustang is more involved in the, in the early development of this breed than I thought they were, but they were. Welcome to Mad About Horses. I'm Dr. Chris Mortensen, and I've been an equine science researcher and educator for over 20 years. And in this episode, in Mad About Horses, we're going to explore and talk about breeds. Why do we have them? Why should you care? Why, why should you care about horse breeds? Now, horse breeds have been developed for centuries, and, and horses have been bred for a specific purpose, from plowing fields to riding with special gates, pulling carts, now today for competitions. And in preparing this podcast, as I was updating my information, I'm learning new stuff. This field is moving at such a rapid rate. And breeds are so important because 
it's important not only, you know, a breed specific how your horse behaves, it also dictates what you can probably possibly do with them. It also has impacts on their health. And we're going to talk about that in this podcast and in a follow on podcast. Because due to breeding, we have carried on some genetic diseases and they are breed specific. And this really is a podcast for everybody. Now, what is a horse breed? Broadly, it's breeds, specific breeds of horses. They have a distinctive appearance or physical characteristics. Now, people outside the horse industry who have not worked with horses, I think it's easier to, to, to say with our dogs. The differences between, say, a poodle, a chihuahua, and a Great Dane. Those are breeds of dogs. Well, we also have that with our horses. And in fact, horses have the most breeds out of any other animal we know of. In fact, you could probably argue there's more horse breeds than there are dog breeds, but they're, they're close. They're close. But both of them have a lot of breeds. We're talking in the hundreds. Now, a more specific definition of what a breed is. A breed is defined as a group of horses with a common origin and possessing certain distinguishable characteristics that are transmitted to the offspring such that the offspring possesses the parent's characteristics. These characteristics make a breed different from other breeds. In essence, what that is saying is a breed characteristic is something that the parents can pass on to their offspring, and it, it is carried on from generation to generation. Now, that does get a little muddy. So there are certain breed registries that characteristics are in a gray area. And then there's other breed registries that they're very, very strict. Breed registries are the ones that govern that breed. They are the ones that dictate the rules on who and who cannot be in that breed. Now, most people want a registered horse with a breed association. That increases the value of that horse. Other people may not care. And if a horse isn't registered, we call that, quote unquote, a grade horse. Their values generally are a lot less than a registered horse. So the breed registry, they maintain the breed register and or stud book. They set the rules and regulations for that breed. And there, there are many rules and regulations. Just to give you a couple of examples, thoroughbreds with the jockey club are very strict on their breeding rules that Mares and stallions can only mate naturally, whereas other breed registries like the American Quarter Horse Association, those horses are allowed to use a lot of our reproductive technologies, artificial insemination, embryo transfer, all these other ones that are out there. But the jockey club is, is very strict in what you can and cannot do. Also, they may have certain or strict breed characteristics and in future podcasts, we'll probably go into some of these bigger breeds and, and talk more about the specifics of them. And it's something we can discuss more as far as you know, specifics to that breed registry. But still in this podcast, we need to introduce the topic of breeds and start broad, and then we'll drill down into some more of the specifics. It is such a big topic. This is something that you just can't cover in a, a, a one hour podcast, much less two or three. So we're going to break this down. I think one of the more useful things is, is to start kind of in categories and types of horses. Now, there's some general terminology used throughout the world in the horse industry. And then different disciplines, it, it does change a little bit. The, the, the verbiage does, but the general concept is the same. It depends on what country you are, are in or what culture. In general, there are body types that we break down our, our horse breeds by. And those are the light breeds. So these are your riding type horses. Think Arabians. We go to the Arabian Nights, the Bedouin tribes in Arabia that made the Arabians what they are today, uh, beloved by many. And we're going to talk about Arabian horses more here soon. Then you go to the American Quarter Horse. It's one of the ones you see out on ranches in, in the Western United States. And then you go to the thoroughbreds and their athletic prowess, to the Hanoverians who are jumping at the Olympics. So those are our light breed riding type horses. 
Then we go to our heavy breeds. So these are our draft horses, our big boys, our big girls, our shire horses, the largest horses in the world that are plowing the fields of England to the Clydesdales that are pulling the, the Budweiser beer wagon to the heavy Belgium horse who's taking his owners for a carriage ride. Those are our draft horses, our heavy breeds. And then we've got our little pony breeds, our, you know, a lot of people's favorites grew up with them. The famous Shetland pony that is, is great for riding with children to the mini, the minis, the miniature horses that brings smiles to everybody's face that interacts with them. Now, real quick caveat with ponies in the horse industry. When it comes to ponies and horses, generally ponies are considered any type of horse that stands 14.2 hands or less. Now, if you don't know what hands are, it's okay. You're not alone. A lot of people don't. What a hand is, is a way of measuring from the ground to the top of the withers, which is like the shoulders of the horse. So right behind the crest of the neck, down their back, there's usually a little bump, and we call that the withers. So in the olden days, they would go and count hands, and each hand is four inches. So 14 hands is 56 inches. So 14 hand tall horse, is their, their wither height is 56 inches high. Now when it comes to hands, there's four. So one, two, three, and then four. So 14.1 is you add that 0.1 is one inch. So if I have 14, one, that is 57 inches because 14 is 56. Add one is 57. 14.2 is 58 inches or 147 centimeters. So anything that stands 58 inches or less or 14.2 hands is considered a pony. Now take this one step further. If we go 14.3, that's 59 inches. Now if we did 14.4, that's 60 inches, but if you divide that by four, that gets you 15. So we never do a 0.4, that's always the next hand up. So 14.1, 14.2, 14.3, then 15. Then 15.1, 15.2, 15.3, and then 15.4 would be 16 hands, and so on and so forth. I know it gets kind of confusing, and hopefully that explains it a little bit, but the, the point is ponies, or a pony horse, is considered anything 14.2 or lower. Now, some breed registries will not call their horses ponies, even though they measure 14 hands. There's so many different breeds out there and they all have their different sets of rules, but this is just general broad stuff with horses. Other terms that are used that you might hear refers to the blood of the horse. You'll hear hot-blooded, cold-blooded, warm-blooded. That does not have anything to do with their body temperatures. It has to do with their temperament, how they are. All horses have a normal resting body temperature of around 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius. If they're hot-blooded, it doesn't mean their body temperature is up higher. It just means they're more spirited. They're more, not high-strung, but just, you know, they're, they're energetic. These are our generally light-bodied riding horses. And the Arabian is the embodiment of a hot-blooded horse. Thoroughbreds. Uh, barb horses, Turk horses are all hot bloods that uh, you see today. Now, to take it down a little bit, warm bloods are generally ones that have been crossed with hot blooded and cold blooded horses, or they're just considered a general even temperament. And these are actually the original cavalry horses back in Europe during the 18, 1700s. Uh, these horses are very, very popular today really well recognized for the athleticism. You see all sorts of different breeds in there. The Irish sport horse, the Dutch warm bloods, Tennessee walking horse, American quarter horse are generally all considered warm bloods. And then you get to our cold blooded, very easy going, very, this is some of my favorites. And I've worked with a few cold blooded horses. These are our draft horses. 
that is what this term applies to. It means they're they're very calm, they're very steady, the gentle giants. And maybe that's why I resonate with them. I'm I'm very tall, you know, six foot five, close to two meters tall, 197 centimeters. And I just resonate a lot with their temperament. Calm, easygoing, happy, ready to work. And 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 that is our cold-blooded horses. So that kind of gives us a general broad overview of the different classes of horses. So we have our light breeds and our heavy breeds and then our pony breeds. But then we can even break it down by cold-blooded, hot-blooded, or warm-blooded. The next big question is, how many breeds are there? And it you see estimates all over the place. And we're talking in the hundreds of breeds that have been developed. Going back to the Food and Agriculture Organization with the UN is probably the, one of the best places to, to get some of our numbers on the number of horses and then the number of horse breeds. There are some academic re- resources out there that their numbers are less than this. And I've seen publications that estimate way more than this. So I think the UN finds a, a, a good middle, middle ground of where we are. Now, they reported that there's approximately 786 horse breeds around the world. That's 10% of all the number of livestock breeds in existence. So when I say there's more horse breeds than maybe dog breeds, dog breeds, they think there's about 300. Horses dominate. We dominate. And again, it goes back to episode one, why they are so important to us and they are our best friends. Now, out of their list, there is 87 extinct horse breeds. One of the breeds that went extinct is was known as the Canadian Pacer. This was one that actually was able to walk across ice and snow really well. The breed went extinct because it was kind of merged into the general Canadian horse. So there was different breeds out there that just either evolved into a different breed or like I'm going to talk about in a future podcast, the Shire horse almost went extinct because there was no more need for them. You know, we, we, we didn't need these, some of these heavy type farm horses or other type of riding horses. So about 87 extinct breeds out of the 786. A large chunk of these breeds, 570 are what is considered local breeds. These are breeds within a country. So each, and and I'll explain this in a little bit, uh, different types of horses that are just found in the borders of that country. Then there are 63 regional transboundary breeds. So these are horses that say are just in parts of Europe or North America, between Canada and the United States, or down here, just between Australia and New Zealand. Those are regional transboundary breeds. And then you get 66 international transboundary breeds. These are the big ones. These are the big breeds that everybody's heard of, or most everybody's heard of most of these breeds. And we'll highlight some of these in in the next couple podcasts. An example of a local breed from Europe, because Europe actually has the most of the local breeds, an estimated 270, is the Podic horse from the Basque region of France and Spain. Small horses, hardy, sure-footed. In the U.S., we have the American Miniature Horse, the Buckskin, the Cracker Horse in Florida, back in my old stomping grounds, was a local horse, or the Rocky Mountain Horse, some people might have heard of. Those are breeds just within the U.S. border. So these are the local breeds. The international breeds, these are the big ones. Just yesterday, I was handling, here in New Zealand, a thoroughbred Irish sport horse cross an Andalusian thoroughbred cross, a Hanoverian. So those are some of the big ones, the thoroughbreds, the Arabians, the Frisians, Andalusians, the fjords, the Icelandic horses, Pasifinos, there's others. These are the big international breeds that you find in many, many countries around the world. That leads to the question, why so many horse breeds? Why do we have so many? I know there's specifics in competition, certain horses do certain things, but 700, that's a lot. And when you look at the history of it, geopolitics played a massive role. 
you have to think of horses as a major commodity back before the automobile. Uh, you know, before the airplanes, before the automobile, it was your horses, how you got from point A to point B. Human history is filled with conflict. Nations constantly at war with each other, especially in Europe. So there was this push to, to produce better horses for riding, better horses for pulling, even working in the mines. Your economy, your, your national identity was with a lot of these horses. So we saw little centers of horse breeding where a lot of these breeds were bred and originated from. And now we can actually start tracing this back the last couple hundred years to see where our modern breeds came from. And really, there are some breeds that stretch thousands of years, but most of these breeds were really in the last few hundred years. And I'm going to explain that this in a little bit on the podcast, uh, but before we get there, we need to go back to the very beginning. And that was domestication. And that's why that podcast was so important. Because that explains the way horses are today, why they act the way they do, why we feed them the way we do, why we handle them or train them. Because back in the beginning, when we were dealing with Equus ferris, the wild horse, we started selecting and breeding. So the, the, the breeding selection started 5,000 years ago. The horse had to be docile. They had to allow themselves to be handled. They had to allow themselves either be ridden or hooked up with a harness to pull a chariot because we have archaeological evidence that horses, that was the first thing they did was they were pulling chariots as well as riding. They had to be athletic. We had to get horses that were athletic, that they could cover long distances, had some endurance, they could handle the riders, and they had to be bred because we had to get those genetics passed on. In that episode, when we talked about domestication, we, research is still ongoing, but what we do know with that selective breeding is that our initial domestic horses were smaller in stature, so maybe pony size or a little bit smaller. They were very hardy creatures. So we think of the Mongolian horse, and I'm gonna, in the next podcast, when I get more into specific breeds, I'll talk about the Mongolian horse. That's the one we think of. That is where we started with a pony size, roughly 14 hands, maybe 13 something, 13 two. So under, you know, 50 inches, 52 inches, 56 inches, somewhere in, in that range, 130 centimeters, 135 centimeters, to a massive shire horse today that stands as nearly as tall as I do. Like I said, I'm almost two meters, to a little miniature pony that stands barely under three feet tall at the withers or 34 inches. They all trace back to those original horses. And how do we know that? So the question is, okay, we, 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 we go back to this original prototype horse, and it's always in the genes. And genetics is changing everything. Everything we know about horses is because genetics is showing us what's true, and, and, it, and it's disrupting some of the things that we thought we believed in. So I know genetics can be a scary science. It's very intense. It's, it can be very complicated. I, I've conducted genetics research in horses. The field moves so rapidly, it's so fast, but it is very important understanding genetics so we understand the history of the breeds. And again, going back to not just behavior, but their health and these specific genetic disorders that we now see in a lot of our breeds. So it is important to, to, to kind of understand how that plays uh, into our horses today. Now, how do we trace the lineage way back to 5,000 years ago? And this is what gets me so excited about science. And this is why I get really nerdy on this stuff. And like I said, I'm, I'm reading the literature and, and I'm getting really excited. I'm like, oh, I can't wait to talk about this in the, in the podcast. But really, I got to break this down a little bit so it, it's easily digestible. And that is one of the ways we know this is through our maternal matrioline DNA or mitochondrial DNA. It impacts us 
And our lineages, our ancestry, that's how we, we trace human migration across the, the world uh, before modern transportation. And now we're using this technology uh, with our horses. Now, to give you a brief overview of mitochondrial DNA and, and not being too scientific, so uh, just bear with me. Mitochondrial DNA is in each of your cells. Each cell of you, because that's what your body's made up of, is cells, and then the cells make up organs, your heart, your liver, your, your kidneys, everything, right? Mitochondrial DNA, we only get from mom. So your mitochondrial DNA that's in you, mine that's in me, I got it from my mother. Father plays no role in, in transferring mitochondrial DNA. Our nuclear DNA that makes, it, makes up us is a mix of mom and dad. This mitochondrial, or that's why they call it the matrial line or maternal DNA, is just from mom, from her egg that, created, that helped create you, held all the mitochondrial DNA. Now, what that means is your mother's mother, your grandmother, or let's do to horses, the, the foal's mom, her mother, passed on her mitochondrial DNA to her. So the mitochondrial DNA that is in you is the exact same that was in your grandmother. And then it was her mother, and then her mother's mother, and her mother's mother, mother. So you can do a direct linear trace of mitochondrial DNA down the, the maternal line. Mitochondrial DNA mutates very, very, very slowly. So it doesn't change much at all. And we can measure it through dozens and hundreds of generations. And this stretches back thousands of years. Why this is so exciting is because the mitochondrial DNA in you is very similar to your great times 10 grandmother or times 20 if you could stretch it back that long. So you're carrying history in your blood, in your cells and everything like that. It's Really exciting stuff. When we apply this to horses, this gives us a big insight into the horse's history. And this research started in the 1990s. Again, with the rapid development in genetics in the last 20, 30 years, we understand so much more. Tracing this back to horses, this is what blows my mind. And hopefully it blows your mind too. Studies looking at this in maternal lineages of horses can trace it back to either 17 up to 46 maternal lines. And you take every horse today, over close to 60 million or over 60 million, you can trace them all back to as few as 17 mares that were the founder populations of all modern horses. That's 5,000 years of history down to 17. So it could be up to 46, some of the studies, but 17, that is incredible. That is why it gets exciting with science. And then it helps us understand when we see a little mutation, we can measure and go back and start looking at the lineages of breeds. It, you know, it, it's going to open up a lot for researchers. And, and, and that's why we talk about it. Because again, when we look at the genetic mutations, and, and I'm going to talk about some right, right now, they are devastating. They are devastating to the horse owner and to you, for those listening that have had to deal with this, genetic diseases are, are, are terrible. Now that we know more about it, we're able to come up with therapies and make breeding selections and try to avoid some of these diseases. So some of the ones that are out there is hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, HYPP in quarter horses. It's a muscle disease. Severe combined immunodeficiency is seen in Arabians. This, one of the worst, is junctional epidermolysis bullosa, JEB, seen in Belgian horses. All terrible diseases. We'll talk about them in a future date, what they are and what they do. But that's just a snapshot. There are more out there. And that's because. We have bred horses so selectively and so intensely that we see these genetic diseases in certain breeds, and, and that's why it's important. Now we know we can trace horses back to as few as 17 mares. 
And like I talked about earlier, in ancient history, we were breeding horses based on the way they were able to handle, they could go distances, they could take a rider, all of those things. So that was ancient history. When we go to the Middle Ages, which is about 1,500 years ago to roughly 600 years ago, horse breeding started to become more common. Um, Think of knights and their horses and warfare, things like that. Horses were selectively bred there. Draft animals started to emerge to be able to plow fields. And then you start to see ponies being developed, smaller horses to do things like pull carts and mines. So that's where we start to see kind of breeding start and happen in, in a more selective manner. Now, in the 1500s and beyond in the Renaissance, this is where breed registries start to emerge in the 1700s. Uh, The Arabian Horse Club was founded in England in 1791, and that's when the general stud book was started for thoroughbreds in England. And then also we start to see breed standards begin to emerge. And then that leads us into the 1800s and 1900s, where horse breeding just explodes. With the Industrial Revolution, really, horse breeding became more refined and more specialized. As the world was modernizing, so breed standards were being created, and this is where we start to see a lot of these breeds explode. And, and, and think about it, like why? Okay, why in the last couple hundred years? Well, the Industrial Revolution changed a lot. You had people living in small communities, mostly farming communities, out working in the fields, out growing food, surviving. Uh, Yes, horses were important, you know, especially in transportation and things like that. With industrialization, you're starting to see people come into cities and towns more. You're starting to see them shy away from an agrarian way of life, an agriculture way of life. So that meant the farmers out there had to produce more food to feed people. And you needed specific horses to do that, to to, to plow the fields, to pull the carts, to bring the produce to the markets. Then we also see sporting taking off. Recreation riding starts to become more popular. And then we, we talked about this earlier, a little bit mental genetics you start to see horses being selectively bred for certain traits like performance, uh, specific coat colors, uh, specific things like that. And this is where you see an explosion of the breed registries coming out. So that leads us to today where we see horses in all shapes and sizes. So like I said, the miniature horse, tiny, 34 inches, three feet at the shoulder, maybe a little bit over there, around 200 pounds or less than 100 kilograms, to the Shire horse, which is over, some of them are over 19 hands. I would, I'd be, I'd have trouble seeing over their shoulders at at six foot five. And they weigh over a ton. And then we see horses like quarter horses that can sprint, uh, sprint a quarter of a mile, one of the fastest animals in, in that distance on earth. And then you have thoroughbreds and standard breds that can race a mile or longer. And then you've got Arabians, which are endurance horses that can go 100 miles or more. So you see this wide range of horses. One of the best examples of talking about a horse bred for a specific purpose, I I think we got to talk about the gated horse breeds. Now, horses move, we call them gates. So walk, trot, canter, gallop. Those are the basic gates. Gated horse breeds can do special gates. It's, it's, they say it's like usually the fifth gate, or it depends on the breed. They have different types of gait with different types of movement. They deserve their own podcast, and they're going to get it here soon, especially when we talk about how horses move. But these are, I sort of think, you know, Aston Martins, Mercedes, Rolls Royce of the horse world. They are supposed to make riding so comfortable that you barely even notice you got a horse under you. So anybody that works a lot with gated horses can probably attest to how specialized they are. And some of the breeds include 
American saddlebreds or Tennessee walking horses. He said one of one of the more popular horses around the world. The Icelandic horse is just a fascinating horse. The racking horse, Peruvian Paso. There's a whole bunch of of them. They all have specialized gates, and again, they are like the specialized horses that were bred specifically just for that purpose for riding. And some of them do pull carts. So that brings me back to the opening. And that was this horse found in Haiti in the 1980s. The colonial horses that were introduced to the Americas has had a huge influence on developing not only the American quarter horse, but many, many other horse breeds around the world. This horse has been called the Caribbean colonial horse. The paper was published out of the uh, University of Florida Museum of Natural History, which does a lot of great work there in the United States. What we know is horses were introduced in the Caribbean in the late 1490s. They made it to mainland North America in the 1520s near modern-day Mexico, and then Florida in the 1538 uh, is when the Spaniards landed there with horses. This specimen specifically dates back to about 1580, uh, where they estimate where it, when it died, it was a middle-aged horse. What they were able to do was extract DNA and look at the mitochondrial DNA genome and trace back its lineage and showing some of the earliest horses that, that were reintroduced in the Americas gives us insight into what breeds were around in the 1500s because we don't have a lot of data on many, many of our breeds. So with this colonial Caribbean horse, when they did that, it was fascinating what they came up with. Looking at its genetics, they were able to link it to the Shinkatig pony, which is also known as the Assateague horse, which is living on the Assateague Island in the United States and particularly in the states of Virginia and Maryland. And it's one of uh, the many breeds of feral horses in the United States. It has such an interesting history that there's legends that they were descended from pirates, that a pirate ship crashed and the horses got loose. Others are Spanish horses that were parts of shipwrecks. Evidence points to really that they were brought to the islands in the 17th century by farmers. So that's 400 years ago, uh, these animals were established on this island in the United States. This colonial era horse that we found in Haiti is its close, close relative. And the, the Chinko Tig pony probably evolved a little bit past that. So could be part of the same founding type herds or horses back in the day. Now, when we carry out that analysis a little bit further, there are other breeds that are very closely related. There's the Iranian breed, the Marimano breed, and then the Caspian pony or the Caspian horse, which is thought to be the oldest domesticated breed in the world. Scientists estimate the Caspian horse breed dates back about 3,000 years, maybe longer. It's an oriental type horse, a Persian horse, so modern day Iran. And it is thought that this Caspian horse had a major role in the development of most of our hot blooded breeds today, which then in turn influenced our warm bloods and possibly our cold bloods. The Caspian horse was an all around horse, it was a riding horse, chariots, war horse. It was actually thought that the breed went extinct but a small number were found in the mountains of northern Iran. Uh, some horses were sent to Europe in the 1970s, and then in the 1990s, some went to the United States. Uh, no exact population size, but it is considered to be a rare horse, but there are efforts to conserve it uh, because it's probably the best representation of what we had thousands of years ago. Now, in the next podcast, we're going to go in deeper into some of the more popular breeds of the world. We'll talk about some of the jobs that they may do. So when I say cow sense, you know, cutting horse, American quarter horse, uh, endurance racing, I think Arabian, pulling a plow, 
a Percheron, a Shire horse. And then we'll talk a little bit about what, you know, the most popular breeds around the world. Take a guess. Which one do you think? Which, which horse do you think, if I thought of a horse breed, which one do you think would be living in, in most of the countries around the world? We're going to talk about that and more in the next episode. So stay tuned. Breeds is so important. And I hope that gives you kind of the broad overview. And then in the next episode, we're going to drill down a little bit more. It, it, it was a big topic to tackle and trying to do well under an hour, explain all the different breeds and why care? Why care about breeds? Why care about specifics? And I think anybody that, that works in the horse industry or cares about horses is going to want to know about breeds. It's just such an important topic. And just to finish out this episode, just to remind you, uh, go check out madbarn.com if you haven't. Uh, go to the Learn tab. Hundreds of articles on, on breeds, breed-specific guides. Uh, we're kicking those out every day. Uh, anything about genetics, uh, nutrition, health, anything about the horse, it should be on there. If there isn't a topic covered, please email me at podcast at madbarn.com. Uh, we can get an article out quickly and then we can possibly use that as a future episode. I just want to thank everybody that's given us five-star reviews so far. Uh, it, we're almost to episode 10. That's when I start liking to ask for those. But if you've really enjoyed the podcast so far, and you've been following us from the beginning. If you don't mind, just clicking that five-star review on Spotify or iTunes, some nice comments. I will read those. I really appreciate the feedback. And check us out on social media, Instagram, Facebook, dare I say TikTok now. So check out Mad Barn there. We've got some great things on there too. Uh, pushing out as much education as we can because we really want to make the world a better place for horses, which in turn will make the world a better place for you. So thank you for listening. <laughs>